What's up everybody, welcome back to the VSO Gun Channel, thanks for joining us here today. And I originally wasn't going to do today's video. It's been sitting on my machine for some time and I was just going to skip it, but then I got to thinking about it and I'm like, mm, you know, there's a whole lot of people out there that are sitting on a whole bunch of parts, some of which may even be uh, completing a project as we speak. And I thought, you know what, I should do that video. This one's going to be on some of the best practices that we use to push that you know, what might be a mid-tier build if you bought sufficient quality components into an excellent rifle. Uh, disclaimer, this is not enough information to complete uh, an AR by any stretch of the imagination. So if you are a YouTube moderator, it's not that. Uh, they'll need adequate instruction elsewhere. These are just kind of the small nuances that are going to keep you from either blowing your face off or uh, doing something that could be counterproductive for the efficacy of the build. These are some of the processes that I use when I'm trying to squeeze the last little bit out of my parts. And along those same lines, today's sponsor is actually me. Uh, I didn't feel like going out and getting a sponsor for this video. So if you guys are interested and feel so inclined, you can contribute on our Patreon and subscribe to our pages. This video is going to be fairly dense, so we're just going to get to it. And starting randomly at the upper receiver, uh, the front of the upper receiver is a flat face that interfaces with the barrel extension. And because of that, uh, you can just put them together. You can just throw the thing together, but depending on how the coating was done, you may have some imperfections in the coating that can reduce the percent surface area contact between the two parts. So to accomplish that, there are tools that allow you to lap that front face. However, if you don't want to buy that tool or you're doing small numbers, then you can use the sandpaper method, just some really fine grit sandpaper, probably a couple applications, and all you're really looking to do is smooth out that interface to ensure that there's maximum surface area contact, can't wobble around. You can see that we've taken nothing but finish off. Right. We haven't moved any metal or anything. And see, that's the difference, is it'll move metal. Right. So, and this is, this is a Noveski. It's right. pretty close. As you saw when we put it on the top of the, the, uh, the CNC over there, that it's, it's really close they'll keep like 500 grit is as good as they'll keep in their shop. Like you can feel this. That's 800. That's 800. Ooh, this is, nothing. this is 15. The next thing I want to touch on is know when to remove factory packing compounds. So there are a couple different things that parts are packed in. For instance, some parts are packed in grease to keep them from rusting. Others have lapping compound applied to them to key surfaces to aid and wear as the components are used. And likewise, you should also know when to clean and apply your own lopping compound for optimal performance. Now we're going to get to a pet peeve of mine, dead end mag releases. Any dead end mag release is simply incorrect. This thing has become more and more prolific in recent years with the integration of the polymer magazine as a standard. Mag catches wear. And as they wear, they may need to be tightened an extra turn to remain effective. Some smaller components can be misaligned that can cause communications issues inside the gun. And one of them that I see a whole lot when we just do things really quick is the misalignment of trigger springs. Depending on the trigger design, this may lead to warping of the trigger spring and that's gonna make the spring less effective. Proper application of thread locking compound. This one's a big one for me, bear with me. For instance, this bolt has factory thread lock on it but you'll notice that it's in the wrong place. Along with that, the proper compound should be used in the correct locations. Blue for regular threads, red for high heat applications, and rock set for nay. Safety tension can be a little bit weird. Sometimes it's part and parcel of the surface finishes of the parts, but the majority of it is driven by the detent and the detent spring. So you may have to adjust the tension there. And by adjust the tension, what I mean is you don't want the thing so tight that it's difficult to move, but you also don't want it so sloppy that it can free float around. And basically the optimal for that is going to be if you're moving the safety to a position, before you get there, it should jump to that position. I've done a whole video on the difference between various types of lowers. And not all lowers are created equal. I'll have it linked in the description box down below. It's worth its own video. You should be aware of it, but know that there are some lowers out there that come with extras. In particular, the ones that I like are the ones that replace roll pins with threaded pins. Just know that each of those various add-ons have their own considerations for Loctite as well. So if you're using one of the ones that has the bolt catch threaded, then that should be blue Loctite. 
if you've got the one that's got the rear takedown detent threaded, then that should require no Loctite because it's got an M plate over top of it. It can't really go anywhere. If you've got one of the ones that has the tensioning set screw that goes up through the grip that then pushes on the lugs of the upper receiver, that one should have no Loctite on it. And the reason that is, is because there is a fitment balance between the upper and lower receiver and the magazine in the well. Those two things have to be balanced. If it's too tight on the upper and lower fitment, then the magazine well needs to be loose. If it's too tight on the magazine well, then the upper and lower need to be loose. That's just part and parcel of how the gun runs. Keep that in mind. You want that little tensioning screw to be able to move itself around if necessary, depending on the adverse conditions the gun is exposed to. This one's a little bit optional, but some receiver extensions have a further extension that sticks out into the lower receiver even more. It has a slot cutout for the buffer detent retainer. And basically what that means is that you have to actively push down on the detent to get the thing to spin. It's a more positive control thing so that it doesn't come unthreaded on you inadvertently and now you're looking around your shop for the detent and spring. Castle nuts should absolutely be staked. At VSO, we Loctite and stake, but there is a third option that has recently come out, and that is the ratcheting castle nut that basically eliminates the need to do any of that. They're pretty nice, I have to admit. Moving on to barrel mounting, and actually to jump backwards real quick, some people will use rock set to kind of bed the barrel in ceramic, if you will. This is optional, obviously. Uh, most ARs have a pretty tight fitment anyway, but if you're going for like super precision, you can do that if you know what you're doing. If you over apply or under apply, you can really jack it up. So for most people, I just say don't do that. But as far as mounting with the barrel nut is concerned, before torquing to spec, the barrel nut should be fitted to the threads a few times. This is similar to the process used to lap the face of the receiver, but failure to properly scar the threads and remove them of surface finish may result in large variances in torque. Side note on torque, remember that torque is done at a 90 degree angle from the tool, unless otherwise stated. Failure to do so will artificially lengthen the lever arm of the system, thus giving you an inaccurate low torque. For best results, attempt torque no less than twice. There are many types of gas blocks out there. Single screw, double screw, taper pin, clamping, etc. A clamping gas block is an absolute cop out. Don't use that crap. Any set screw that goes through the block and contacts the barrel should have a barrel relief point allowing for it to index. This can be accomplished in a few minutes with the correct tools and it will absolutely lead to a bomb proof installation, especially if you use something like rock set. Final rail alignment. Boy, do I have opinions about this. <laughs> oh boy. You should do a visual check on both the muzzle perspective and at the receiver rail junction. This will ensure that your sights are mechanically zero to the barrel and reduces the likelihood of issues while performing the final zero and uncomplicates things while performing a maintenance of zero in the field. The other thing, rails. If they don't have an anti-rotation tab that actually locks itself into the upper receiver, the thing is trash. Tension rails on barrels, we're talking about heavy vibrations, guys and gals, don't use those. They need to have some kind of mechanical stop on them, a torque plate or a extension that comes off the rail extrusion to keep that thing locked into place. All right, guys and gals, well, that about wraps it up for our quick and dirty synopsis on some of the best practices that we use here to squeeze that extra little bit out of our rifles. If you found the video interesting and informative, please hit that like and share button down below, leave a comment. Thanks for joining us and hopefully we'll see you guys on a future video.